All right, here's the, the theorem we proved last time. So we gave, uh, where is it? Uh, so we showed, we introduced a number of different characterizations for the Hagger property. These were all listed right here. And then we gave one, uh, one way of proving the Hagger property, and which is by showing that a group acts properly on a space with walls. And we defined what a space with walls was. Uh, and so for example, that was the corollary I've written here, if gamma acts properly on a space with walls, uh, and by acting on a space with walls, I mean acting on the set and preserving the wall structure. Uh, so then uh, gamma has uh, the Hagler property. And so for example, free groups, because they act on their Cayley graph, which is a tree, uh, they act properly there. So the free groups have uh, Hagler's property. Um, or uh, free products of uh, cyclic groups. Uh, they also have their corresponding trees. Or another example, maybe let me give this uh, another example, and that is if you take uh, Z mod uh, 4Z, amalgamate a free product over Z mod 2Z with Z mod 6Z. So this is again a group uh, which is an amalgamated free product of cyclic groups like this, uh, amalgamated over a finite cyclic group. And so this will again act on, acts properly on a tree, it's bass serre tree. Uh, so this group has, has Hagerup's property. Uh, has this property. Uh, but this group is just a, uh, isomorphic to the group uh, SL2Z. Uh, so the group SL2Z has Hagerup's property as a consequence. So let me uh, maybe prove this isomorphism uh, because we'll, to prove it, we'll use some ideas which we'll use later in the course. So it's probably worth it to spend a little bit of time to prove uh, that SL2Z is isomorphic to this. Uh, actually, what I'll prove is I'll go ahead. So if you notice this amalgamated free product here, Z mod 2Z uh, lives in the center here. So I'll co go ahead and quotient out by Z mod 2Z. And in fact, I'll prove this. So the claim is that uh, PSL2Z, so that is SL2Z uh, modulo the um, center um, is isomorphic to Z mod 2Z, free product Z mod 3Z. Uh, and then uh, this corresponding isomorphism for SL2Z will, will follow. Uh, so we'll prove, we'll prove this and I'll give you an explicit isomorphism. Specifically, I'm going to show that this, uh, so this group here is generated by the elements one, zero, one, negative one, zero, and zero, negative one, one, one. And then if you look at this for just a moment, so let me give these names, let me call this S, and let me call this T. And if you think about it for just a moment, so I'll leave it as an exercise uh, for you guys to check that these do generate uh, PSO2. Actually, I can uh, almost sketch it for you. Uh, I wrote it down somewhere. Um, yeah, so note that if you look at just S times T, then this is the matrix, the elementary matrix 1101. Uh, but also if you look at T times S, then this is the elementary matrix 1, 0, negative 1, 1. And so you get that all these elementary matrices are in this group group the S and T generate and the elementary matrices already generate PSL2Z. Uh, so these two, these two matrices do indeed generate PSL2Z. Uh, the other thing to notice uh, is that S squared, this is equal to, I guess, negative one, zero, zero, negative one, which in PSL2Z is the identity element because we're quotienting out by the center. Uh, and we have that T cubed. You can also check that this is the same thing, negative one, zero, zero, negative one, and hence is the identity element in P 
PSL2Z. Uh, so uh, PSL2Z is generated by this order two element, this order three element. So to get this isomorphism here, I just want to claim that there are no relations between S and T. So that's, that's what we'll prove. Uh, so the claim is that, uh, so there are no uh, relations between S and T. So in other words, if we have a word whose entries are elements of S and T, then other than these two obvious relations, uh, the word can't be reduced. Uh, so let's go ahead and prove that. So let's suppose that W is some word, some non-trivial word in S and T. Uh, so non-trivial means that you don't see any powers of T cubed or higher, and you don't see any powers of S squared or higher. Um, so you just see T or T squared and, and S. Uh, and, uh, and then I want to claim that, uh, that this is a non-trivial, uh, this represents a non-trivial element in, in this group. So to do that, uh, one thing which maybe will make it life uh, slightly easier is that if, say, this word starts with an S or ends with an S, then we can conjugate by, say, a T, or if it starts with an S and ends with a T, then conjugating by T squared gives us a, a T on the start in the beginning. So uh, by conjugating by T or perhaps T squared, we may assume that this word begins and ends with a power of of t. All right. If we want to show it's non-trivial, then showing any conjugate of it as non-trivial is fine. So we'll assume that this word begins and ends with the power of, of t. Uh, so then the thing to notice here, and this is how you prove whenever you want to prove something's a free group, uh, is you do some sort of ping pong uh, argument. And that's what we can do here. So we'll consider this action. So PSL to Z acts on the extended real line by fractional linear transformations. So this is by A, B, C, D. X is AX plus B over CX plus D. Uh, so this is, this is a well-studied action of PSL2Z. Uh, the extended real line. And, uh, and then you just check that uh, what do these S and T do? Uh, so S of X, this is just then, well, S is 0, 1, negative 1, 0. So S, is, S of X is just uh, negative 1 over X. Whereas T of X is what? Negative 1 over uh, x plus one. All right, so these are the two corresponding transformations. And then the thing to note here is that if we look at, uh, uh, maybe we also want to look at t squared. So t squared times x, uh, this is just, uh, well, t squared, you can check here. So that's t, let me also put here t squared since we're going to use that. Uh, so t squared is going to be what, negative one, uh, negative one, one, zero. So the t squared times x is then uh, negative x minus one. All right, so these are these 
three transformations we get on the extended real line. And then the thing to notice is that we just have, um, that if we look at S and plug in any negative number, uh, then we get a positive number. And if we plug in T to any positive number, uh, so then we certainly get a negative number. And similarly, if we plug in T squared to any positive number, uh, then in this case, we also certainly get a negative number. Uh, oh, that's not what I want to use though. I want to use that if we plug in T to any negative number, T squared, uh, no, that's what I want, right? That is what I want. Right? T squared applied to a positive number, we get a negative. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Uh, so therefore, what can we say? So we get the therefore, this um, word, when we plug in zero infinity, so the word is going to be made up of t's, t squareds, and s's. And so we know it starts with a t, so we're going to move zero infinity to the negatives. We're going to move this positive number to a negative number. Then we're going to have an s, which will move the negative number back to a positive number. Then we're going to have a t or t squared, which moves it back. And so we ping pong back and forth. And eventually at the end, we're going to end we're going to hit it with another t or t squared, so it'll be negative. So whatever this w is, it takes the positive numbers and sends them to negative numbers. So in particular, it's non-zero, right? So therefore, w is not the idea. All right, so that proves that these two elements are free instead of PSO2, and, and hence you have this isomorphism. So it has Hagrid's fault. Uh, any questions about that? Okay. So let me uh, now, the next theorem I want to prove is about Hagar property and wreath products. Uh, so let me give you a definition. So definition will say that uh, a group gamma has a proper wall structure. Uh, basically, if we can turn its Cayley graph into a space with walls. Uh, so if there is a family of walls, W on gamma, such that uh, gamma together with this uh, W is a space with walls, Uh, such that the left action of gamma on itself, or I should say the action of gamma on itself by left multiplication, by left multiplication, uh, is a proper action on a space with walls. So this is what we saw, for instance, for the free group. Uh, we saw that it has the Hacker, Hacker property because we could give a wall structure on its Cayley graph, such that left multiplication, uh, we get a proper action on a space with walls. So uh, this is, for example, free groups, we have such thing. Uh, not every group with Hacker property will have such a wall structure. Um, but we know that free groups do. Okay, uh, so then what can we do? So I want to, oh, I also want to introduce the wreath product. Here's another definition. If lambda and uh, sigma 
our groups. The wreath product of sigma with lambda is the group on gamma, which is you first take a direct sum of the sigmas, and this is indexed by lambda. And now, I want to put lambda first, let me give you a little more room. So we take a direct sum of sigmas, and this is going to be indexed of lambda, indexed by lambda. So if lambda is an infinite group, this will just be some infinite direct sum of sigmas. And then I just noticed that lambda x on this infinite direct sum by just permuting uh, the entries by a left multiplication on itself. So, uh, no, so where lambda x on this direct sum by permuting the entries by a left multiplication. All right, so if we identify this set, uh, this set right here is just um, uh, a function from lambda to sigma, such that it's the identity outside a finite set, and, uh, and then lambda x on that by just shifting the support of this function. So the support is whenever it's not equal to identity. So it just X on the support. All right, so this is the wreath product. Uh, this is uh, this construction comes up quite a bit in operator algebras uh, because it's related to Cartan subalgebras. It gives a nice example of Cartan subalgebras when sigma is abelian. Um, uh, okay, so maybe we'll discuss that a little later. But um, what I want to prove. Any questions about the construction here? All right, so the theorem I want to prove here is that uh, if sigma is finite and lambda has a proper wall structure, so then uh, the wreath product Oh, the Urey's product is usually written by sigma and then Reese product lambda. That's the terminology. Uh, so then the Reese product, sigma Reese product lambda, uh, has a proper wall structure. So as a corollary, that uh, lambda, uh, well, as a corollary, it has the Hagerup's property in particular. In particular, this will have Hagerup's property. All right, so that's the theorem I want to prove. Uh, so this, this theorem, there's a more general version. Uh, so not, I mentioned that not every group with the Hagerup property acts uh, properly on a space with walls, but you can generalize the notion of a space with walls. And these are called uh, spaces with measured walls or measured spaces with walls, I forget. Um, and, and you can characterize the Hagerup property as having a proper action on a uh, space with measured walls. And then you can generalize this theorem to spaces on measured walls. So when sigma and lambda uh, both have the Hagerup property, you can, you can do this and, uh, and you get this theorem, this more general theorem, which I'll mention down here. And this is due to um, Cornelier Uh, to Sarah Mallet, and that is that um, if sigma 
and lambda and Hagerup's property. Then so does the reach product. All right, but I'm not going to prove this general result. I will just prove this theorem up here, whose proof is uh, found in the book of Ozawa and Brown and Ozawa, and uh, and has a simpler simpler proof. So in particular, though, this applies to say uh, Z mod two Z reef product of free group on two generators. So that gives you another example of a group with Hager property, which is a bit more interesting than say free groups. Uh, okay. Uh, let me go ahead and copy this over to the next page so I'm not having to immediately erase what I'm writing. Give myself a little bit more room. All right, let's do a proof of this for Okay, so the hypothesis is we have a wall, a proper wall structure on lambda. So let's let uh, W sub lambda be a proper wall structure. For lambda and let's let like we've done before, we'll let script H uh, be the collection uh, of half spaces. Remember, each wall is made up of two half spaces. Two, right? it's, each wall is just a partition of the set into two subsets, which we call half spaces. All right, so I'm going to define the new wall structure on the reef product as follows. So uh, for each half space H and for each function mu, which maps the complement of the space to sigma and is finitely supported, We're going to set E sub H mu. This is going to be the set of things of the form XS. This is in my gamma. So gamma is going to be the reef product. Uh, XS and gamma. And here X will be, so remember uh, the reef product is a semi-direct product. So here X will be in the direct sum of sigmas and S will be in lambda. Uh, so this is such that S is in H. And so X is an element in the direct sum. So let me remind you that the reef product here, uh, I'll just write it over here for now, uh, the reef product or on the last page, this is just a semi-direct product. And so we can always write any, if gamma is in this reef product, uh, we can write gamma is equal to X times S with X in this direct sum which again, we can think of as just finitely supported functions uh, into sigma and S and lambda, because lambda normalizes this. So here we're going to consider e, e H mu. This is going to be the set of uh, elements in gamma, which are the form X S such that S is in this half space H and X restricted to the complement is equal to mu. And then the other half spaces will just let be the complement of spaces of these forms. So then we set our space with walls. We're going to set W 
is just going to be all collections of E H mu E E H mu complement such that H is in H and mu has H complement sigma finally split. So this is our wall structure, and all we have to do now is to prove that this actually is a wall structure and that the left multiplication of the group is proper. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, do that. I'm sorry, uh, can, you, can you again um, tell me the, the, the definition of E, the set E, E of H mu. Um, yeah. So the definition is E H mu is going to consist of all things. I don't know where this floating next. Uh, it's going to consist of all elements of gamma, uh, such that when you write them as x times x times s with x and the direct sum and s and lambda, then you have s lives in this half space H, and you have x when you restrict it to the complement of H. It agrees with this function mu. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, we're okay with the definition. All right, so certainly this defines a subset of the wreath product. And um, yeah, certainly it defines a non-empty subset of the wreath product and it's also not equal to everything. So it gives a, a partition. Um, yeah, so let's find out what does it mean for two points to be separated by one of these walls. Right, so note uh, if we have XS and YT, if these are both in this wreath product gamma, uh, so and they're separated, um, so what does it mean? It means so X, XS in this set E H U. Well, this means I'm just writing down the definition again that S is an H and X restricted to the complement is equal to mu. And if we have Y T, which is not in this set, so what does this mean? This means that either T is not an H or uh, Y restricted to the complement of H is not equal to me. And so I just not say anything so surprising. Uh, but uh, the point of this is that in either case, we have the therefore, if we look at the complement of H, and we intersect that with this set T union, the support of X inverse Y. Well, either T is in this set, so it's non empty, or if T is in H, then we know that X equals this and Y does not equal mu, so X inverse Y uh, has non trivial support. There. So either way, this is non empty. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that therefore, well, we have S as an H. So therefore, H and H complement uh, separate Uh, S from some element here. But for each element in here, there are only finitely many H's which separate them. Um, and so there's only finally many elements in here which can be separated from X by an H. And since this is a finite set, this means that there can only be finally many 
um, H's that separate S from one of these supports. So this means that therefore there are only finitely many H's such that E H mu and E H uh, E H mu can separate X S from Y T. So this is finite. So therefore, there are only finitely many uh, H's in I have space such that E H mu separates X S from Y T. Uh, but not only that, but once we've fixed H, then what do we know? We know that mu is completely determined by X, right? Because of this equality up here. So if X S is an e, e H mu, then there has to be a unique mu that corresponds to it for each H. So therefore we can't have infinitely many mu either. So what we get is that therefore, uh, note since mu is determined by x restricted h complement, uh, it's uniquely given. So whenever you have that x, xs and yt are separated from eh mu, there's only one choice of mu we can take. So there are finitely many choices of h, and for each h, there's only one choice of mu. So therefore, there's only finally many uh, choices of both. Uh, so therefore, only finally many E H mu's separate X S from Y T. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's also easy to see that at least one does, mainly if S and T are different, then just take any H and um, take any H which separates them and take mu such that it's, you know, satisfies this, uh, satisfies this equation. And then you get that that E H mu separates XS from YT. And if S and T are equal, then just uh, take again any uh, if x and e if x and e, uh, sorry if s and t are equal, then all you can do is just take um, uh, some h which so in that case this x is different than y, so at some point they're different, so take some h which contains that point and then take mu such that it equals this and then it won't equal that at all. So there's at least one wall which separates any two points. So it separates. There is also. I have one question. At least one e h mu. Yeah, just one moment. Separating. It says from y t. So therefore, we get that gamma. W is a space with walls. All right, what's, what's the question? Uh, what's, how should I understand that, that part was that support of X inverse Y? What does that exactly mean? Uh, so remember X here is in the direct sum. So X here, uh, maybe I don't wanna erase, well, I'll have to go on to the next page in just a moment. So X here is in the direct sum of, uh, of sigmas um, indexed by lambda. So we can think about this. So this direct sum, let me write it over here, scratch work. The direct sum uh, over lambda of sigma, this we can think about as functions F uh, mapping um, lambda. Yes. to sigma such that uh, f 
of t is equal to e for all, oops, for all but finally many uh, t lambda. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, right, so this is what we think of the set, and then the group is just, uh, the uh, multiplication is just pointwise multiplication under this description. And so the support, by the support, I just mean this is a set of all t in lambda, such that f of t is not equal to e. Yeah. I, I was just more confused with what would the x inverse be, but I guess just taking the inverse on every entry. Yeah, right? it's just pointwise, yeah. And this, this is a group under just pointwise operations. So inverse is pointwise and multiplication is pointwise. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so what we've proved so far is that W is a wall structure on gamma at least. Any two points are separated, any two distinct points are separated by a wall. And for any points, any two points, there are only finitely many walls which separate them. Uh, the next thing we have to do is we have to show that this wall structure is preserved by left multiplication by gamma, and then we have to show that this action is proper. Uh, okay, so to show that the wall structure is preserved, we can just do that uh, by cases. So if S is in lambda, so then let's just look at what the set E H mu is. And you just see what is this? This is, well, how does, uh, so, Uh, yeah, let me, I already wrote it here. Remember, this is what it means to be in E H mu. It means S is in H uh, and uh, X restricted to the complement is in H. And so here, maybe let me use a different T. So what are things in this set? Uh, it's T times things such S, such that, uh, uh, yeah. So when we multiply T times XS, remember what we're going to do is this, this is going to be, uh, we twist by the action, and then we have TS. So for the S part, we just multiply by T on the left. And so when we multiply by H, we're just going to get TH. And then for the other part, what is the new X here is just conjugation by uh, X by this T. And so the, that's just exactly the uh, corresponding multiplication we'll get by multiplication by mu. So it's maybe a bit confusing because uh, when I write conjugation here, I mean conjugation in the wreath product. But conjugation in the wreath product, T, X, T, is just, uh, when you view them over here, it's just you're shifting the support. So it's just T dot X. So this is maybe, let me put a dot there to emphasize that this is just moving the support. All right, so if T is in lambda, then T acting on the set just shifts the H, which again, we know is also in there since it's preserved the so H wall structure on lambda. And then it just shifts the support of mu over by T. And then similarly, if we have X in this direct sum of sigmas indexed by lambda, so then what is X E H mu? Well, in this time, uh, we don't interact at all with the variable from lambda. So this is just going to be H E H. And then the other variable, we just multiply by X. So that just changes uh, this to X times mu. 
I guess I should be explicit and say x restricted to h complement times u. You use a function on h complement. Uh, so in particular, whenever we multiply by something in lambda or something in this direct sum of sigmas, we get another wall. So this says that the left action does preserve the wall structure. And so finally, the only thing we have left to do is to show that this action is proper. Uh, so which, yeah, let me remind you, we need to show properness. So we need to show that the action is proper. So IE, that just means if you intend to infinity in your group, then uh, multiplied by a fixed point, you tend to infinity in the space. So IE, if we take any, uh, well, we could take the identity element in gamma. So then the limit as gamma tends to infinity of gamma times e is infinity. In other words, the distance, if you look at this distance from gamma times e to e, this is infinity. This is what we need to show, properness of this action. Uh, Or another way to say that is that we need to say that for any finite number, there are only finitely many elements such that this distance is less than that finite number. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll fix some n, say, greater than or equal to 1. And uh, and suppose that in this wall distance, the distance from, well, gamma times e is e. So this is x s to e is less than or equal to n. So there are only n walls, at most n walls, which separate x s from uh, e. But remember what it meant for a wall to separate x, s from e. That meant uh, either uh, x was separated from e, or sorry, s was separated from e, or it meant that um, x uh, restricted to the complement of, of some set was, um, was different than e restricted to the complement, which is, of course, the identity function, so it just means that x is non-trivial on the complement of that h, right? So what do I mean by this? Uh, it says then, if you look at this set s, union, the support of x, this is contained in the set of t and lambda, such that the distance here from uh, t to e is less than 10. Uh, that's just what I, what I just said. So if, if s could be had a distance for, for each half space separating s from e, we get a half space separating x s from e. Moreover, for each half space for each element in the support of x, if we have a half space which separates that element from E, then we get um, then we get a half space E H mu which separates X S from E. But what do we know about this? This we know is a finite set because by hypothesis the action of lambda on itself was a proper action on the space for points. Uh, so therefore, if the set of all x s such that its distance less than equal to n, 
Uh, that gives that both the S itself and the support have to live in this finite set. But also, sigma is a finite group. We haven't used that anywhere yet, but I guess we're using that now because for each element of the support, there's only finitely many choices for values we can take. So we get the therefore, this is a finite set. Um, therefore, set of all, that's S V gamma. This one. And that finishes the proof that there's a proper wall structure. Oh, excuse me, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I don't understand why we can uh, have a distance of T and E in the wall structure of gamma. Uh, no, this is uh, the wall structure. So there are two wall structures here. And this one is in lambda. Oh, sorry, oh, okay, lambda. Right, so the H's, the H's are half spaces in lambda. The E H mu's are half spaces in gamma. Gamma is the wreath product. Oh, sorry. So, so, but is is E an element of gamma? No. So I'm using the same. Yes. So I'm using the same notation here. This is the identity in lambda, and up here it's the identity in gamma. So I'm just using E for the common identity. You could replace it with one, I guess, maybe if you're. Uh, so I mean. By one or E, I just mean the identity element in whatever group we're working in. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I don't know why I said if one is in gamma, of course. We, want, we need to show that the action is proper. So IE, that maybe is a bit clearer. All right, thank you. Other questions? Okay, and like I said, this proof is uh, taken more or less directly from Brown and Ozawa's book. Uh, it's a very elegant proof. I don't think I can improve on it. So um, if you need extra clarification, you can also look at Brown and Ozawa's book. Uh, all right, so now the next uh, topic I want to maybe discuss is some applications to operator algebras of these properties. So we've introduced now amenability, Hager property, property T. Uh, so for this, maybe we'll need a few more preliminaries. So let me begin with uh, just a general definition for c star algebras. So now we're going to shift gears for a little bit, and then we'll come back to these sorts of things. So here's a definition. So if A and B are C star algebras, and we have phi, a linear mapping from A to B is linear. So then phi is positive. if it preserves the positive space of positive elements. So if uh, phi of uh, x star x is greater than or equal to zero, and this is for all x and a. So that's the definition of positive map. So v is the scalars, and this is just a positive linear functional. Uh, we're used to that. Uh, and then we'll say that phi is completely positive. If, uh, so of course, if A and B are C star algebras, then on the matrix algebras, Mn of A, uh, there's a unique C star norm on Mn of A, which if you like, if you view A as, so C star algebras always have a concrete realization inside of V of H, and then mn of a will just be the realization inside of v of h direct sum itself n times. Uh, so matrices uh, in a give another c star algebra, and we consider this amplification of phi, and we want this to be positive. If this is positive, 
external pain. And this is where this amplification is just defined by uh, entry-wise. So AIJ, if this is your matrix, and this is just defined as applying phi to each of the entries. So that's how the amplification is defined. Uh, so from when we're dealing with states, uh, positive is all we need, and we get lots of nice properties like the GNS representation, the GNS construction and this, this sort of thing. Uh, when we're mapping into general C star algebras, uh, positivity turns out to not be enough to give us all the representation type theorems we want. Um, so this is why we need complete positivity. I will just be working with complete positivity, so I, I won't be working with positive maps, uh, but there's a standard example of a map which is positive but not completely positive. And that is, if you look at A is equal to B is equal to the two by two matrices uh, with scalar entries, then the transpose operator you can show is positive, but is not completely positive. All right. But I'm less interested in examples of positive, not completely positive, and I'm more interested in examples of completely positive maps. So one example, is that uh, if uh, pi mapping A to B is a star homomorphism, well, if you have a star homomorphism, then its amplification is again a star homomorphism, and star homomorphisms clearly preserve positivity. So then I is completely positive. I'm just going to abbreviate completely positive by CP because we're probably going to have to use it right a lot. We're going to have to use a lot. So complete. Uh, another natural example of a completely positive map from A into itself, say, or uh, would be just conjugation because we know that conjugation preserves positivity and again amplification of conjugation is again conjugation. So it's another example is that if we have x is an a so then this map say phi x which takes a to x star a x is completely positive. And then we have this uh, theorem, this is Steinspring representation theorem, which says that if we're mapping into B of H, then these are basically the only completely positive maps or some combination of these. So this is the theorem, Steinspring uh, dilation theorem. And that is, so if A is a unital C star algebra, this can be done more generally, but for simplicity, I'll just assume A is unital. That's how we're gonna use it. And phi mapping uh, A to B of H is uh, unital completely positive. So that unital just means that it takes the identity element in A and it takes it to the identity element in B of H. So if you have a UCP map from A to B of H, so then there exists a Hilbert space K and uh, isometry V mapping H to K and a star representation pi mapping uh, A to B of K such that 
phi of a is equal to v star pi of a v, and this is for all a and a. So clearly this map is completely positive since it's a, it's a composition of a, ho a star homomorphism together with conjugation. Uh, and Stein Springs dilation theorem says that in fact every completely positive map, every UCP map into B of H has this form. So it's important here that we map into B of H. This is specific for mappings into B of H. All right, so let me give you a proof. I guess I'm starting to go over, but I'll just give you a sketch of a proof anyway. This is really just like a G, another GNS construction. We've already seen this before for states. We saw this for positive type functions. And here's just another iteration of this uh, sort of thing. Uh, so specifically what we do is we consider, uh, first we want to find a natural Hilbert space. So we consider this uh, on just the algebraic tensor product here of A with H. Uh, we define an inner product by uh, A tensor C, B tensor eta is phi of V star A, C eta. And then you extend linearly. So this defines a sesquilinear form on this, uh, on this algebraic tensor product. And then I claim that this is a non-negative definite. And to check that, so then if you have some sum here, AI tensor CI, and you take some sum here, AI tensor CI, the same thing, we want to show that this is non-negative definite. Well, we just plug in the formula. So this is a sum as i and j goes from one up to some n. And here we have phi of a j star a i c i c j. And then we just realize that this is exactly um, just this matrix here. Well, it's going to be phi the nth amplification of this matrix, which is, uh, I guess, uh, A1, A2, An star, A1, A2, An. And we multiply that by this vector, C1, Xn, and then take the inner product with this vector c1. So this, uh, where this operator right here, this is in the, uh, I guess, uh, is an operator from uh, oh, probably one of them columns. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. Now this is an operator from, uh, yeah, here. It lives in here. Uh, now, if you want them to be n by n matrices, you can just add a bunch of zeros uh, below here, that's fine. But it's still a positive, uh, the point is, is that this is a positive operator in the n by n matrices over A because it's something star times something. Um, so this is a positive operator and phi is completely positive. So it's nth amplification is positive. So this is a positive operator and we're dotting, we're multiplying that positive operator by a vector and then taking the inner product with the vector itself. So this is always non-negative. And that's the key use of complete positivity here. Uh, okay, so uh, what does that mean? That means we get a Hilbert space. We get K by taking the, um, maybe there's some kernel. And then we take the completion and this is a Hilbert space. 
we get an isometry by V C is one tensor C. You can check pretty easily that that's an isometry. And we get a representation, pi of A times B tensor C is going to be AB tensor C. Now you have to check uh, that this is indeed an isometry and you have to check that this extends to a star representation, but these are easy things to check and I'll leave it to you guys because I want to quickly move on to more interesting stuff. Uh, and then the final thing to check is that you indeed have that phi of A is equal to V star pi of AB. So this is a very rough sketch of Steinspring's theorem, um, but all of these steps are very easy to check, so I'll leave them to you. Or again, you can look in any, any standard book on operator algebras and you'll find a proof of this theorem. This, this is a standard proof for um, operator objects.